So welcome back. This is lecture 14 of Introduction to Computational Bioengineering, Dynamics on Networks. Today, we're gonna to be talking about parameter fitting. As always, I need to remind you that this class is live streamed and recorded. So today I wanna to talk about uh, first the idea of parameter fitting and model structure and parameters. Uh, then we're going to look very quickly at uh, some parameter optimization algorithms. We'll talk a little bit about the problems you face when you're doing parameter optimization. And we'll only talk about them a little bit. Uh, Herbert's textbook goes into more detail on some of these issues. And then we will do some fitting. And we'll do some fitting uh, with synthetic data rather than real world data because it's faster. And I would like very much to get to those last sets of exercises which talk about what happens if you have the wrong information when you try to do a fit. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about, which is something we've talked about many times, is that models come in two parts. There's a model structure, for example, the network that you're modeling and the rate equations. And they're the parameters that live on that network. Um, and if I have a given model structure, then its behavior is dependent on its parameters. And we've done a lot of things in the class where we change the parameter values and see how that changes the outcome of the model. Um, what we wanna be able to do ultimately is ask the question, uh, given a model structure, uh, is it able to replicate some set of observations in the real world? Uh, in the first case, does it adequately describe the things that we already know? And secondly, if we actually want to use that model, we want to be able to ask the question, does it predict things that we haven't observed in the real world yet? And one of the big problems with artificial intelligence methods is that they're quite good usually at doing the first and reasonably not good at doing the second. There's certain kinds of generalization they can do, but they're pretty limited. We're not really going to be able to address prediction very effectively today, but we'll talk about it a little bit. And so parameter fitting and competence are some of the terms that are used to describe what we're going to do. Um, the first thing we might ask is, if we have a set of experiments and we have a model that we believe describes the things undergoing those in the, which we're observing in those experiments, is what mechanistic models are about, uh, can we find parameters that mean that the model does as well as possible in replicating what we have in the experiments? And that's called parameter identification. And one of the problems that we're going to face uh, in is that uh, very often there may be multiple sets of parameters that do equally well. And uh, your optimizers, we will find, will give you a single solution. And Herbert in his textbook talks a little bit about uh, what to do to try to deal with that problem. Um, once you've got a set of best parameters, what are called best fit parameters, you ask the question, how well does the model uh, reproduce the data? Uh, in principle, the model's uh, some abstraction of reality. So even uh, under ideal circumstances, it may not perfectly reproduce the observation. And in addition, uh, experimental observations are always subject to experimental error and noise. If the model is stochastic, then all bets are off in a whole variety of ways, but we're not going to address stochasticity today uh, in terms of structure. And, and then we'd like to know how much confidence should we have first at our uh, parameter values. Uh, as I mentioned, this is where this issue of having multiple parameter values give you the same Degree, uh, degree of accuracy come in. Uh, and then also how much confidence do we have in the model structure, which is something that's actually very hard to deal with and most people don't address. And then uh, how good is the model for making predictions? Uh, that is its range of validity, which is also something that tends to not be addressed very much. Uh, but ultimately, what we're going to start out by doing is having some model structure, and we're going to adjust its parameter until 
the predictions of the model do as well as possible to match our target so-called experimental data. And Herbert has a little bit of workflow uh, here where he starts with uh, experimental data and a model. Uh, and as again, I would separate model into two components, model structure and parameters. And then the idea of fitting uh, gives you parameter estimates, parameter confidence and goodness of fit. Uh, we're going to talk about parameter estimation and goodness of fit, but not parameter confidence today. Uh, his uh, chapter has a good explanation of that. Uh, and then uh, generating fitted models. Um, we're going to have to have, uh, to do this, uh, a model structure, uh, data that we're trying to fit, uh, decisions about the parameters we're going to vary. And I'll say this again, uh, maybe in a slide or two, you may see that repeated. Um, a function that uh, quantifies how good our predictions are, how bad our predictions are. Um, and some kind of uh, decision about what we're going to accept as a reasonable fit. And then we're going to use numerical optimizers then to uh, try to play with those parameters from some initial guess uh, and come up with the best possible set of parameters. So again, we're going to be going through some series of steps. We're going to create target data. We're going to have to read it in. We're going to have to decide what parameters we change in our model. We'll have to create a function that calculates the difference between the observed target data and the model predictions. Uh, we're going to have to tell the optimizer what kind of optimization to do, because there are a lot of choices, uh, what uh, metric it uses to compare the target to the predicted values. Uh, what additional values of parameters to pick, and it, what ranges to use possible. And then we'll have to invoke the optimizer. We'll find some optimizers give you a lot of fine-grained control. Uh, some of them don't. And uh, actually, the calls for optimizers tend to be very complicated, and we'll try to minimize that complexity. But if you want to get into this field, uh, there's a lot of flexibility, but that flexibility comes with some cost in terms of figuring out how to use the things. So let's just start out with a very simple example. Here we have four data points for a species S versus time. And what we see is that S is mostly decreasing in time, although it does increase from time two to time 3.5. And so we have some knowledge of the system if we're doing mechanistic modeling. Um, if we were doing uh, pure AI-based inference, we might not have any fundamental knowledge. Um, and here we're going to say, well, maybe this is a chemical species that is decaying with first-order decay, exponential decay. And so I'm going to make a hypothesis that I'm going to try to say that this is actually an experimental observation with some inaccuracy in it of a chemical species decaying in time. And that model has two parameters, the initial concentration of the chemical, S0, and K1, the decay rate. And I should actually have written K1 times S here rather than K1. Uh, I grabbed somebody who uses the alternative notation. And I didn't catch that. Uh, once we've made that hypothesis about exponential decay, then for any initial value S0, and any rate K1, we'll get a time course of the chemical concentration. Uh, here's the blue line for one particular choice of S0 and K1. And we'll find that at each time point, there is some difference between the predicted value, the blue line, and the actual value, the red dot. And that difference is called a residual. And we'll notice a couple of things already in this simple example. In some cases, the red dot is bigger than the blue line. In some cases, the red dot is below the blue line. So the residual could be positive or negative. In the second thing, case, uh, in this example, 
we didn't measure in our experiment, we didn't measure at uniformly distributed time points. We measured at time a half, one, two, and 3.5. And so that's something that we often will face when we're dealing with experimental data. Uh, we can finesse that when we're dealing with uh, synthetic data. But in general, we need to have uh, be able to generate our predictions at any given time, not just at the times we normally would if we run simulate. We also have multiple parameters, the initial value of S and the rate constant K1. We need some way of saying how good or bad our fit is. And that means that for each of those individual residuals, we have to come up with some metric, some scalar that aggregates them to say what the net quality of our measurement is. Now, a very simple thing we could do would be just add up the errors. But if we add up the errors, some of those errors are positive and some are negative, that'll cancel out. And so the simplest thing that people will do is square the error and do a sum squared of errors. It's called chi-square. And that's the usual return. Well, it's called the loss. These have a lot of names. They can be called an objective function, a cost function, a loss function, if you're doing neural networks. Sometimes residual is used also to mean the aggregated thing as well as the individual value. But what we need is something where at some level, if the, exact, if the prediction between our model and the real observation is exactly spot on, this is a function that should return zero. And as the deviation between our predicted and observed values gets bigger, whatever that means, it should return a bigger number. And that way, what we will do is adjust the parameters, k, to try to minimize the cost function or the objective function. We may not be able to get to zero, but the best we could do is whatever set of parameters give us the smallest possible output. Now, summing the squared deviations makes a lot of sense if the numerical range of your variables is not very big. Uh, and if you have multiple variables, if all the variables have roughly the same values. Uh, if you have very large numerical ranges, you'll often do things like take logarithms and sum the squares of the logarithms, or you'll use things like hyperbolic tangents, uh, which of course you use in neural networks. Um, there are a whole series of different loss functions or objective functions that can be used. Uh, here, you're going to be calculating the objective function by hand. We'll be using chi-squared. Uh, but you do have to be aware that picking those loss functions is going to be an art. And you'll have to look at the structure of your data uh, in order to understand what makes sense. If you have a single variable, then your chi-squared is just the sum over that one variable minus the vector of those that variable minus the predicted values. If you have five if you have five variables, chemical species A, B, C, D, and E, the simplest thing to do might be to add the squares of the errors for each one independently. Uh, that only makes sense if the numerical values of each one are about the same. If one is concentration of micromoles and the other concentration of moles, uh, and you add them up using the same units, then the micromoles won't do anything. And so if you're used to doing neural networks, you'll get have gotten very used to doing normalizations where you scale the errors and scale the, the the deviations as well, uh, so that you can combine uh, errors from different data series together in a way that's meaningful. Again, today, we're not going to go into great detail here, uh, but it is something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, just the way when we were talking last week about stochasticity, 
where the numerical value made a difference when you were using Gillespie, which it doesn't for ODEs. Uh, here as well, you need to make sure that the size of the errors for the different components are comparable uh, in your loss function. Otherwise, it'll ignore completely one of those components. Uh, optimization is often thought of as a surface. Uh, in a picture like this, we have in one direction, the value of parameter one, and second direction, parameter two, the vertical direction is the value of the loss function. And our optimal solution is the value of x1, comma x2, where the loss function or the cost function is minimal. There's also some point where it's worst, but usually we don't care about that. Uh, what's more of a concern is that in this space, there are going to be dips and valleys that are called local minima. And what we don't generally know, because we don't have a view of the entire surface, is that if we are in a local minimum, we don't know if that minimum is in fact just the local minimum and that there's a better minimum further away, or if we're in a global minimum. And so we're going to find very frequently that we have local optimizers that are pretty good and efficient that'll find the, min the local minima nearest to where we are. But to actually understand global minima is not a soluble problem. And that's typically what we want to do. And so you'll hear the words local and global optimizers and local and global minima used a lot. Again, the optimizer will wander around on this certain landscape looking for the lowest point. <clears throat> there are a lot of different algorithms uh, that can work. Uh, you start out with some initial guess. You define a range over which your parameters can vary. Here, we've drawn a square. So I'll define the range of our parameters. And then we have to perhaps worry also about a trade-off between the parameters. It's possible that, in fact, the parameters are dependent on each other in some way, in which case your optimizer can get confused because you can have the same value for all sets of parameters provided they're related. Optimizers get confused. Um, there are a number of different algorithms for doing optimization. Uh, the classic deterministic local optimizer is called gradient descent. Here's some curve, which we imagine is the cost function, or chi squared in this case, as a function of parameter p, we pick an initial value of p. We look at the slope of the cost function as a function of p. We project in the direction of re reduction. In this case, we overshoot our minimum. We change our step size. We go back, and we go back and forth until we get to the minimum. Uh, that's a great idea, uh, but it will find local minima. It will find the nearest local minima. And in general, that doesn't give us what we need. Uh, there are fancier ways to make this converge faster, but they still wind up giving you a local minimum. One of the things that that depended on was being able to take a gradient of the cost function. And unless we have analytic, <coughs> analytic results for the cost function, that tends to be pretty expensive numerically and pretty inaccurate. Uh, so there are other kinds of methods. One that we'll use a lot uh, is a simplex method, uh, Nelder Mead. It's pretty uh, fast and efficient. Uh, there's a YouTube you can watch if you want to know how this works. Uh, the basic idea here is that instead of trying to calculate derivatives, uh, you just see what happens by walking through your space. And in this method, you pick three points in your space. You evaluate the cost function at each point. Uh, you say which of those three points is the worst. Uh, you jump that point to a new position. Now you still have three points, but they're three different points. Uh, and you can do the, and you keep doing that. So effectively, you're numerically approximating the slope of the surface. So here I have my three points. I calculate 
uh, which one is worst. In this case, I reflect that point that was worst to a new point. I calculate again. Uh, if the reflection point is better, I keep going in the direction I was going. I say that was a good direction to go. I'll keep going. If it was worse, I come back towards where I started. And if I'm really stuck, I try to find a new set of triangles that maybe gives me a better result. Uh, and I keep doing that uh, until I get some result. Those are the kinds of methods that you have. And if you want to look into detail, you'll find literally books written about each method. And you'll find lots of methods. And there's a reason that there are so many numerical methods out there. And that is that uh, none of them work very well. And the reason that none of them work very well is not because there's anything wrong with the numerics of the method or the algorithms. It's because optimization is, in general, not a soluble problem. Uh, if we imagine the world of our optimizer in one dimension, being something like A, which is best case, there's a single minimum at the bottom, in the middle. And wherever I start, if I go downhill, I'll wind up there. In that case, any optimization algorithm that I will use will work. On the other hand, suppose I'm in C. If I'm in C, if I start out in the left in that little bowl over here, I'll find my global minimum. If I start out here, over in the right, my values are independent of my value parameter. And so hopping around there doesn't do anything. And I have no information about where my global minimum is. And that often is called a golf course potential because the golf course is flat with holes. But unless you're right on the hole, you don't know there's a hole. And in those sorts of situations, there is no algorithm that will find the result sufficient. You have to explore and hope that by accident, you run into a hole. There are algorithms for searching around uh, relatively effectively, but those tend, those tend to be, there really is nothing you can do in those situations. Um, B is an example of a local minimum. I have two cups here. If I start in this range here, I'll come to the correct one. If I start here on the right, I'll wind up in this lower, in this higher valued minimum. And I won't know that there's a better solution. I could have a bunch of minima that are the same or nearly the same. And that's a situation also that I don't necessarily know the answer to. In the presence of noise, I may not know that one of these is really better than the other. They may all be all equally good. And so I may actually legitimately have multiple solutions to the same optimization problem. And then in this golf ball, golf course type world, if the min minimum is very small and very sharp, and I'm taking finite steps because I want my optimizer to converge in a finite amount of time, I may jump over it and wind up somewhere else. And that happens too. Um, one thing to do is to play with your parameters by hand and get a sense of how smooth or corrugated your landscape is as you change those parameters. If things look like A, any optimizer will work. If things look like D or C, no optimizer is going to do a good job. One thing that we can say is that the closer you start when you're doing optimization to the actual optimum, the more likely you are to find the best value. And so if you have any way of knowing where that optimum is from something that's not inside of your algorithm, you have some experimental measurement of a value, you have some argument about why a value is constrained, the closer that you can constrain your parameters and the closer you can guess where to start, the more likely you are to succeed. Uh, using constraints 
to limit your parameter ranges is very important, especially for what are called global optimizers that try every possibility. Because trying every possibility with no constraints takes an infinite amount of time. Uh, and so one of the things that you have to do when you use constraints is to check if your optimizer bumped up against the constraints. That can happen. And the last thing to do, it doesn't sound very elegant, but actually something that, for example, the machine learning people know, uh, is that you have to try multiple guesses for the initial values of each parameter. You don't just run an optimizer once, you run it 20 times with 20 initial conditions. If every time you run it, you get the same result, then if you were not unlucky, it's telling you you're finding the best solution. If each time you run it, you get a different result, then you're more likely to be in a situation like C or D, where it's a fundamentally hard problem. And then you come into the question of parameter identifiability. And that's something, again, that we're going to, Herbert talks about some in, the, in the, his uh, textbook. And he gives some code for We're not going to have time to talk about today. Among global optimizers, there are a couple that tend to be used pretty commonly. Simulated annealing, which was developed a long, long time ago, uh, is a way of um, jumping around stochastically in your parameter space looking for your optimum. Uh, here's a video from YouTube uh, showing the optimizer wandering around in the parameter space. And one of the things that these uh, simulated annealing algorithms do is that they go uphill. They go, they pick worse values as well as better values in the hope of jumping out of local minima. Of course, that also means that you could be, find your global minimum and wander out of it again. Uh, and it can take a very long time uh, to converge. There's no guarantee of converging. In simulated annealing, you start at some position. Uh, you propose a jump to another random position uh, in your parameter space. You calculate what happened to your cost function or your residual. If you're better, you make the jump. If you're worse, you make the jump with some probability that's exponentially weighted by what's called the temperature fluctuation. The bigger the temperature, the more likely you are to jump uphill the more likely you are to jump out of a local minimum. On the other hand, if you keep jumping around, you never converge. And so you have to have somewhat what's called an annealing schedule where the fluctuations you allow uh, are reduced as the simulation progresses. And what you'll find is that uh, that annealing schedule then is depend. You need to adjust that annealing schedule based on the problem you're trying to solve. There also are genetic algorithms where you make a bunch of guesses of uh, possible solutions. And then uh, what you do is you pick the ones that are pretty good and you combine them together, and generate new guesses based on those positions. Uh, and that can also give you reasonable outputs. Again, there's no magic. If you're in one of those golf course potentials, None of these methods will work. In the case, again, of a genetic algorithm, we start with initial population of guesses of parameter values. We evaluate the cost. We say the bigger the cost is, the less fit we are. We're looking for best cases. Uh, we select some subset of those. Uh, if we say we found some that are good enough, we're done. If they're not good enough, we combine them, mutate them, and try again. And that works uh, reasonably well. We'll find that uh, if you're very patient, uh, both simulated annealing and genetic algorithms, very good uh, at solving things. Uh, but you have to be pretty patient. Even for a simple model, uh, you couldn't do that as an exercise in this class. Most of those will take hours and hours and hours, uh, even for a very simple model before they give you anything back, because they're trying thousands or millions of possible values. Okay, so let's actually try doing this. Um, so we're gonna build up uh, the basic case of parameter fitting uh, and we'll do it uh, using synthetic data. 
Um, we're going to focus on the optimizers in SciPy because that's available easily to everybody. Um, uh, we're going to find out that the way this is structured in the examples I'm doing, there's going to be one small thing that we have to change from the first example to the second one. Um, and I'll point out again that what we're going to be doing today is doing looking for a the, the set of parameters that fit our data the best. And that's a necessary step in optimization, but it is only the very first step of optimization. Because in general, we are going to be looking for the cloud of solutions that do pretty well. And we're going to ask the question about once we've got that cloud, how well can we identify our parameter values? Uh, what's our confidence interval? How well do we predict? And so on. So we're only doing the very first step of a long, arduous process. And I'm afraid it will seem reasonably arduous just to do that first step, which is why people often don't go to the next steps. So again, we're going to create some target data. We're going to decide which parameters to change. We'll create a function that calculates the residual. We're going to tell the optimizer what to do. We'll tell the optimizer, do your thing. So the first exercise that I'd like everybody to do, and everybody's going to need to have uh, Delorium running now, and I really do want everybody to do this. Um, we're going to do everything later on uh, as teams. But for the moment, I want everybody to just uh, for themselves get Tellurium running, whether it's on your desktop machine or on, uh, on uh, NanoHub and write a simulation that calculates exponential decay. A goes to nothing at a rate k times a. And I hope by now that doesn't take more than three minutes. So let's make sure everybody has that. Giuliano makes the point that when you're doing a parameter optimization, I talked about adjusting the residual and having different loss functions that depend on the residual uh, in different ways, like logarithmic scaling of the residual. And Giuliano points out that when the parameter itself, when different parameters have different numerical values, strongly different numerical values, you may actually have to have the optimizer work on the exponential of the parameter value or the logarithm of the parameter value rather than the parameter value itself. That's a good point. The particular examples we're going to do in class today are all designed so that you avoid those complexities. But it's good to know that they're there uh, before you get started. Does everybody have Tellurium running? Does everybody have their decay? Does anybody need more time? All right. So you should have something that looks like this. Everybody get that? So that's going to be our target. And that data set. We're going to call that our experimental data, even though we used a model to generate it. Now, the nice thing about that is that if we then try to fit it, we know exactly what the model to fit it is. So if we try to fit our experimental data, our generated data, with the model we used to generate the data in the first place, we'd say we ought to be able to get the fit to be perfect. If we can't, we begin to worry. And so the first thing we should say is that we ought to be able to fit this exactly. We had an initial concentration of A. We had an initial value of K1. We should be able to reproduce that. So let's see how we can do. So the next thing that I would like people to do is write a Python function uh, that returns for each time point in our series the difference between 
the model prediction for a tip for a specific set of parameters and the experimental one. And in this case, to begin with, you'll return a vector which consists of all those differences. So if I calculated my exponential at time one, two, three, four, five, I'd have a value x sub one, x sub two, x sub three, x sub four, x sub five. I pass my function, my residual function, a guess of the initial concentration, a zero, a value of k, k. My simulator simulates my model for a and k. It calculates the difference at the times I was told to calculate. And then it returns a vector with those results. Does that make sense? Okay, I would like each, how many people? We have 11 people. Uh, what is a good group size? Is a group size of three better or four better or two better? I think three is good. Three is good. So, so then the, the question is, do we do do we do do four four three, or do we do three three two? Four four three. Okay, fine. So I am going to put people. Why can people take a screenshot of this? Everybody take a screenshot of this. And I'm going to give you five minutes to try it together to come up with a residual function to which you pass the parameters and which returns a list of those differences, okay? And I'm going to actually do, I'm gonna actually assign you, to, so we're gonna have three breakout rooms. So I'm gonna assign people uh, more or less randomly. I'm gonna try not to put people into um, into the groups that you're used to, and if I miss if you miss you, I apologize. Share that data plot again. It was something like a, a scatter plot, not a not the line plot, right? By just the data are at at, at, at fixed times. So, okay, so, so I can use what, the... so simulate returns points. Okay, uh, it returns pairs of points. We tend oh. to draw it with lines, but that's the way we draw it. It's not the way the data are. Written. Sounds good. You don't want those specific points. That was my question. Uh, you have to, if, if you pass the data series, which has time, comma, value, you have to calculate the value at each one of the times you're passed. Okay, I'll figure out. Okay. I don't know, Giuliano, do you want to circulate and try to help people out or shall we just give them five minutes to see what happens? Uh, yeah, I can circulate maybe in a minute or so. Yeah. Give them some time to do things on their own first. But I wanted people to try it before I give them the results. Mm -hmm. Yep, good call. And the people, the people, the 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 the, the people in in the from from uh, neuroscience have been doing neural networks, so this this is something they know how to do. They may not know how to do it with the optimizers we use, which are simpler than the ones they're used to. Uh, but but optimization is something they do every day. Yep. Yep. So I tried to split up the the, the neuroscientists to try to put you know, 
put them in different rooms uh -huh. to help each other out. Mm. Yeah, seems like a decent spread. It's also true that Josh always gave this lecture. Mm -hmm. I made some change. I made quite a few changes to it, but it's still not really quite what I would have. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to give somebody else's slides. Those exercises, that, I mean, actually, it's funny because the, the exercises I wrote, or it's the, the, hmm. the sequence of exercises in this lecture, ones that I, I drew. But, but, but the slides around them and the specific solutions that he came up with. Okay. Actually, looking at looking at the looking at the code, I have a feeling that the, that, that that residual calculator was mine. Because it's very Fortran. The uh, comma P, with, yeah. With all the slicers, slicing yeah. and the iterators. Yep, yep. Uh, you could, I'm sure that there are NumPy functions that would do that. A lot of those things hide a lot of those, uh, those uh, stepping through the data by hand things that I've got. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would do, yeah, I would do the difference of the times and find the argument. Yes, Pete. Hey, Peter, what's up? I have a question about how to generate the experimental data, or what is F in the slide here? So, is it something that we have to generate at runtime, or is it something that we write out manually? So, A is so you're going to use it that that function that we just wrote twice. You're going to run it once and you're going to save the output. And that will be your experimental data. That will be A of T. Then your function residual will take a set of parameters. In this case, there are two parameters, the initial value of A and the K. It will run the simulation for those values. And at each time point in your initial data set, it will evaluate the difference and return that as a vector. Oh, okay. I'm I'm overthinking it then. So I'll see you. So maybe Giuliano, it's worth going around and just making sure people aren't totally lost because I guess yep. I went too fast. I should probably have had a picture. Yeah. With those. Yep. Let me do that. Because I don't want to take too much time on this, but if they can't do this, nothing else works. So. Yep, yep. I'll be right back. Okay. Aiden, have you ever done optimization? Um, not much. It's it's um, it's very important, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a little bit of it when I was doing like protein folding stuff, but it was mostly just with built-in algorithms that would spit out a number. I never looked too deep into how exactly they were calculating it. Well, protein folding, of course, is a as a problem. It's a, a notoriously unsoluble problem. Mm -hmm. And Google, 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 a little bit. They they said, "Oh, we solved it with AI." Well, no, they didn't. <laughs> right. They said they declared victory, and then. I mean, it's true their method probably works as well as anything else out there. It's not, but but none of them work. Uh, 
unless you're lucky. But but mm -hmm. but but protein folding does have a have a real problem, which is you get some structure, calculated structure, and you have the actual structure, and it's not obvious how you get the difference. Right. Um, if if you really know that each atom is in a very specific position and your structure is quite close, then you can take literally do the, the distance between the center of mass of the atom, which where it's supposed to be, and it's actual, it's calculated center of mass. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if you're if your if your prediction is far from your actual value, then doing center of mass distances doesn't give you anything. It gives you that flat region where everything is the same. Uh, that's right. actually a classic example. The, the rough landscape and the flat are both things that are completely characteristic of protein folds, partly because there is no good metric. If you have, if I have, uh, if I take say 500, carbons and so many nitrogens and so on. And I say, put them in some random configuration. And I say, how close is this to the thing I want? There isn't a good metric for defining that distance unless I'm very close. Hmm. And so then uh, none of these algorithms work. You're basically stuck with, with um, uh, guessing. We get stuck with genetic algorithms or or, or um, simulated annealing, but you have incredibly high dimensionality because the position because the position of every atom is three for three. You've got three three coordinates plus an orientation, so it's 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 very expensive calculation. The dimensionality is incredible. Um, yeah. So, so what, what classically these AI systems do is they recognize, gee, if it's a protein, this particular sequence tends to clump up in this particular way. So you do local folding, and then you try to aggregate it. Mm -hmm. um, and that works some of the time. Uh, again, this is what we were talking about at the very beginning about intelligibility. The fact that proteins do fold reliably means that, that the sequences in proteins are not random. Um, so there are, there are repeatable patterns. Um, and a lot of the time that, that, that means that things are intelligible in some way, and that means the AI methods can work. Mm -hmm. um, but up in Indianapolis, the Lido was, um, I think he's retired now. Keith Dunker was a computational biologist, biochemist. And his specialty was uh, proteins that are, are active and functional when they're not folded. There are quite a few. Oh, there, aren't any, there aren't any which are active or functional when they're completely not folded. But there are a lot where there'll be some scaffold that folds and then there'll be some region that's randomized. And it's the randomized region that's the active that does the important thing. Right. Yeah, and there was a, some of the work that the other part of my group when I was at Hopkins was doing was membrane, membrane active proteins. They were doing experiments where you would drop, drop a protein onto the membrane and it would partially oh, fold yeah. and do one thing and then um, you know, get through the membrane and do the rest of its job. And then, and then, of course, with that, you if it's a, if it's a transmembrane protein in general, right? What's your target? Your target is X-ray crystallography, but you can't do X-ray crystallography with a membrane-bound protein. Nowadays, I think they can actually do. They have these nano X-ray scattering things. They can do stuff, but but in general, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. if, if if the isolated protein doesn't crystallize, you don't know what to do. How do you know whether you got it right? You don't have any way of knowing. Right. There is no target. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's how we, the way that we would check is you would feed in a, um, a PDB file of the experimentally determined shape. And I think it would just do center of mass calculations to see yeah. how close you were. But if you didn't have a, a well-known shape or a reliable PDB file, it was just like, well, can we actually check this? Or are we just watching something cool on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. when I was a grad student, there was a period when I thought that protein folding is what I wanted to give my life to. And then one of the one of the one of the most inspiring lectures I ever heard was by Prusner. And that was before he won the Nobel Prize. That was when people still thought he was a flake. Uh, because the idea that you could have a protein that induced misfolding in other proteins was something that was very controversial. Right. Uh, I mean, it is weird that that's a thing. Has there ever been any real discovery of the mechanism behind that? Well, it's a patterning thing. It's basically, it's template. Um, fields and, interacting with fields, minimizing fields, and making fields fold themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was known. It was known in a specific case before before Freon, which was was in in, in 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 sickle cell anemia right the 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 genetic defect means that 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 uh, the hemoglobin polymerizes and that makes the that makes the the red blood cells rigid so in that particular case it was accepted what was not accepted was that there would be normal proteins that would have two states where one of them could do something like that. Because it was, I think the thought was that that was so risky that you would you would avoid it in some fundamental way. Right. I mean, so, so, hey Gabriel, how's it going? Going good. You got a solution? I think so. Pete, uh, I can't take credit for Pete's work, though. So he was the one <laughs> who got us our solution. I think I'll, I'll give people, uh, let's see if broadcast works. Hold, hold B to broadcast your voice. And can, I hope people can hear me. If so, please uh, take one or two more minutes and then come back to the main room. If people could hear me, maybe take one or two more minutes and come back to the main room. I don't know if that works. No idea you could broadcast audio. Brand new feature as of like it's two weeks feature. ago. It's oh. a new feature, but I don't know if it works. Somebody told me last time it didn't. I didn't. Uh, well, if your client hasn't updated either, it may not be working for everybody. I may send you around, Juliana, to gather people back, but maybe Marcus. Yep. Can I, oh, why don't I just do that? Can I ask you to join room one and two and bring people yep. back? And I was just saying that the code I have for, for doing this that I'm going to share to people if they're stuck is not very elegant. 
people could very well have nicer code than I, than I generate. Did my broadcast saying, please come back work or not? If by broadcast, you mean Giuliano, then yes. If you mean the Zoom oh, function, oh, then no. I, I, used, I used the audio broadcast feature. And, oh, we just, didn't We didn't hear your big booming godly voice over the intercom now. Okay, so it failed. That's what it that did. was. It did fail. Right. Uh, there was a minor audio glitch at one point, which might have been you, but it didn't sound like anything. I think I qualify as a glitch. Uh, I'm not proud. I could be a glitch. Okay, how'd it go? You guys have one? Did, uh, how about other people? Did, so room one got something. Room three said they got something. How about room two? How did it go? Eden, Florva, Zach, how'd it go? Conceptually well, still minor syntax bugs, but mostly was we were just ironing it out at the end okay does somebody want to show their result not everybody just one one group somebody want to show what they got i can show for our group if that's okay with you guys so okay we'll do that so pete was very quick on solving this one and it's basically, instead of passing a parameter, we are passing the uh, models to compare, and then we are getting the results, right? And we can change this to one and see that is zero since the original one is one, as it should be. But whenever you change it for a different value of K, you have an error difference going up. Anyway. OK, great. That certainly got the core idea. Does anybody else have something they want to show? Okay. Let me let me give you my solution. And uh, I'll share the code going forward. Uh, again, if we had if we had an unlimited amount of time, I definitely would want people to, to work it all through because you learn more. But um, I think trying it is important. So let's, um, here's what uh, I have. And uh, if you want, I encourage you, I'd like everybody to go and download uh, example zero. If you pulled everything up, you should have a text file called example zero that has this code in it. And this is not the most beautiful code in the universe, I will say. It, it's very Fortran-y code. And so what I'm doing here is that um, very much like what, what Peter did just now, um, I'm running a simulation uh, for a particular set of parameters. Um, but the issue that I have to deal with is that when I run my simulation, I don't necessarily know um, what times I'm going to be looking at. If I run this, if I'm running purely synthetic data, I could say simulate 0, 100, 1,000 twice. But if I was reading in an experimental data set, it might have a time point at 0, 1, 5, 15 and a half, 18. And so what this not very elegant simulation does is it reads in the times in my simulation, and then it simulates between those times to calculate the next one. And in this case, we're taking advantage of this fact that simulate stores its status. And so if I invoke simulate without doing a reset, it continues the simulation forward in time. 
And so what I'm doing is I'm walking through the time intervals in my original data set, and I'm manually simulating forward time to time to time to time. And I'm sure that there are more elegant ways of doing it, but that's how I do it. And so I would like everybody to, to, to download that, pull that in just as text into your, into your, um, into your notebook. And if people, if people had a way of doing this that's more elegant, uh, that's fine. But I want to make sure we can move ahead because we've got a long way to go in the next hour. Okay, so can everybody just make sure, let me know that you got this. If anybody hasn't gotten it, let me know. So you'll need it. If you have code that does the same thing, by all means use it. Is it clear how this code is working at the moment? Something that we haven't really talked about in class at all is how Python function definitions work uh, and scoping. So my, my assumption has been that people were familiar. And most people are. In, in your breakout groups, if, if you're not, help each other out. Okay, so now I wanted to introduce optimizers. So now we've calculated our residuals. Uh, and we're going to be using uh, primarily the SciPy optimize package. There are a lot of optimizer packages in Python. Um, I would ask you uh, to take a minute uh, to look at the SciPy. Actually, maybe not. It's a little intimidating. Um, uh, find on your browser uh, the SciPy uh, optimize package. And it, the link is here, but if you simply search SciPy optimize, that's what it will take you to. Um, and there's a lot of detail there, maybe too much detail. Um, and I, I uh, would encourage you to do a little bit of digging, uh, not right now, but in, as in your breakout sessions. That's one reason to work on it together, um, uh, to see some simple use cases, because these optimizers have an almost unlimited number of functions, and, and figuring out what the argument structures are is it's a little bit like using Py, uh, uh, PyTorch. Uh, they're incredibly powerful, but figuring out how to structure the things to call it is a pain. Uh, so uh, that's going to be the issue here. Um, I, I dug a little bit. This realpython.com has a nice tutorial on this. Not time to go through the tutorial today, but something I'd recommend. Um, for our purposes, the only thing you need to know at the moment is that you'll need to do from SciPy import optimize in addition to import Tellurium and, and NumPy and these things. Um, and I would recommend uh, taking a quick download example one. We'll be looking at example one in a minute, for how to do it. Uh, the basic structure, and, and this is where there's a little bit, I, I regret a little bit the way I structured the example, is that there are a whole bunch of optimized functions uh, in uh, SciPy, really a lot. Um, the one we're going to use first is called least squares. And it takes as an argument a function that returns the vector that we've just calculated of residuals. Uh, and then the second argument, x0, is a list of the initial guesses for the parameters. So you need to have a NumPy list or an array that has a list of the number. If you have six parameters to optimize, you have to have six values. Uh, you can also define bounds for each parameter, saying what the minimum, maximum allowed values. Um, generally, we'll be using, after the first example, we will be using the minimize function rather than least squares. And it also takes as an argument function. But in this case, function is not a vector of residuals. It's the scalar, the, the chi-squared, the sum of the squares. Um, 
And I don't know why they defined it so that one uses the individual vector of the values and the other one uses the, 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 the sum of the square. Uh, but you'll, you'll have to change things from the first example to second. The other thing that you get in that minimize is that least squares only does one optimization method. Um, the minimize lets you choose whether you use a local optimizer, whether you use simplexes, whether you use um, all sorts of other things, or whether you try a global optimizer like uh, simulated annealing. So, okay. But we are going to have to face the fact that the thing I asked you to calculate was the vector of differences. And you're going to have to, after the first example, sum the squares of those differences to return. Questions about that. Um, the other one that is a nice package uh, is uh, LimFit, LMFit. And it's actually a little bit more sophisticated than the one we're going to be working with. Um, and uh, I have a, Siri, a, a, a Jupyter notebook that teaches that as well. Um, it's called Lecture 14 Fitting with LMFit. And you should have that in the downloads that you just did. Um, and if your if your group decides you'd rather work with that one instead, uh, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to be assuming you're using the SciPy optimizer for the rest of this class. The LM fit is a little bit. It lets you. It lets you. If it lets you look at what's happening during optimization in a way that's rather nice, which is a plus. So, the next exercise, and I'm going to ask people to break out again, is uh, use uh, the gradient method. Uh, that is going to be uh, least squares. That least squares one. Uh, to actually optimize, and here it says K, but it'll also be the initial value of A as well. So what I want you to do is you're going to generate, you're going to generate your target. You're going to use the residual function, and you're going to call these squares with the residual function and the list of parameters, in this case, there'll be two parameters, uh, A0, initial value of A, and K1. And you're going to then have it see what happens. And it will return an array, which will give you the optimized parameter values, which will be two, uh, and a flag, one to four, saying, did I succeed or did I give up? And I'd like you to try that. Uh, and if you get it working, um, I'd like you to repeat it for five different initial guesses for here I said K, but maybe for K and A, and ask you a question, does it give you the same result each time or not? In this case, we know there's a single solution, so we know the answer. The answer. So we'd hope we would get the same answer each time. What I'd like people to do is to take, take five or 10 minutes uh, to try it, as groups. Um, if after five minutes you're stuck, I will give you the code. You've already got the code. It's example one. But I'd like you to try it without looking at the full example one first uh, for five minutes. Uh, after five minutes, if you're stuck, uh, pull the code in, run the code together, and see what you get. Is that is that a reasonable assignment? That makes sense to everybody. Any questions about that? Again, why don't you screenshot the exercise uh, so everybody you have it uh, for reference? And if you need to, you can reference. You can jump back to the uh, jump back to the manual. As I say, that manual page is a little bit intimidating because there's so many options on it. If you scroll down. To the bottom of that manual page, or you go to one of those tutorials, you'll just find some simple example, or look in the in the in the uh, in my example one. 
uh, and see how the calls are done. But I would like people to try generating at least five, 10 minutes on five, 10 minutes on that. So why don't people take, uh, let's say seven minutes as groups uh, to try it on your own. And then after seven minutes, if you don't have it working, load the, load the code and run it together and answer the question. Uh, if you try five initial guesses for K and A, you get the same answer every time, okay? So why don't people break up, stay in the same teams you're in, or keep with the teams for the for the remainder of the class. Any any questions about that? PJ put his put the paper up on bioarchive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to him last week. He had some suggestions for the phenol cells thing, and I suggested that he put in a preprint to have something citable for tissue forge. Yeah, that would be helpful. Because kind of, that's kind of my plan with PhenoCell as well. I have a preprint so that it can, I have something to cite and mm -hmm. then do conferences and whatever. Yeah, well, it used to be that, that NSF and NIH wouldn't let you cite preprints mm -hmm. in grants, but now that's okay. Yep. Um, I was just sending out a mail mail that I can't I can't do the group meeting tomorrow. The problem is that my mailer beeps. And so I have to remember to close the mail client while I'm lecturing. Actually, I don't know. Does, does Zoom blank those beeps or do they do they show up in the Zoom? I can hear them sometimes. So then, I don't know if it was smart enough to not let what slack beeps go through yeah i don't know those notification noises facebook linkedin i i i really i know you can turn off notification but to me it's really it's really annoying yeah i, yeah, I turn all of those off i never let any website send extra notifications besides just the thingy on the tab yeah my problem is that a lot of these are things i i used for so long i didn't understand five 20 years ago that i needed to not let them notify me and so now the question is finding how to turn off the notifications i know there must be a setting somewhere The inability to communicate with people in the breakout rooms is a real problem. Yep. It's... There should be a more stable chat. Speaking of, I should probably do some rounds. Yeah, if you do that, because we're already at, it's already 10 minutes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So can you check where people are? And if basically, if they haven't gotten it, ask them to, 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 to load that to load that example and make sure they run it and then move on. Okay. Yep. And then after they've run it a couple of times, bring them back. Okay.
Any luck? Actually, my my example that I asked you to that example one actually includes the next exercise too. So I guess we get to skip them. Out. But it doesn't run it five times and compare the results. That 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 is the one. Did the video, if I if I type do typed broadcast, does that show up when you're in the? That one did show up. Um, the only difficulty is, at least for me, it shows up in the bottom corner. So if you're actively looking into someone else's eyes and engaging with them, there's a chance you missed if it's in the peripheral vision. But it does show up. That's right. It's not persistent, right? It flashes and then goes away. Yeah, there's a limited duration on it. You also won't see it if you're like tabbed out of Zoom and you're looking at the code. Yeah, Zoom could definitely have better communication between the head node and the, and the breakout rooms. You'd think for a company solely based on communication, that would probably be one of the first things they would look into. <laughs> well, again, it, doesn't, it just doesn't strike me that it should be that hard. If you could, if you could send it, if you can have a, a chat mm -hmm. Why can't you direct a chat to the, you click on the say, I want to chat with X. Why does it matter whether they're in the head node or in the, in the breakout? Okay, let's see. Let's pick somebody who hasn't talked yet. Purva, what did you get? Yeah, hi. I was like in a in group with Eden for Eden, and actually they were doing the work, so I did not uh, write the code. Did they they were the ones, yeah. Did you run it? Yeah, I mean, I can I can uh, I can share my code. I have it okay. here. Uh, there we go. So yeah, this is basically this is basically what we did. We just we just ran. Um, we just ran the least squares algorithm over the residuals function. And then we, we looped over P, we changed P to different va values. Um, we started out with something pretty extreme, like 4,000 for K and uh, 1,010 for A. Um, and we also, so then we printed the, uh, the result as well as the covariance um, result or whatever. I'm not sure what, what it, whatever flag that they respond with, whether it's successful um varying from one to four um and so it i didn't really we didn't we kind of spent most of our time trying to understand what this number exactly meant um but we ended up printing them all out and the ones that i mean unsurprisingly the ones that were closest to 0.4 and 10 uh were 
closest to getting the actual answer. Um, and then the one that we made really extreme, it was able to get A very easily, uh, but then it, it kind of stopped at, um, at just getting A right and it didn't change K really at all. Okay, so you generated it initially using 0 0.4 and 10? Uh, yeah, so we just used the, um, the residuals code that you had. And so uh, it used it incorporated right. the anemone string that you uh, with those values. Yeah. Could you change from a ten and point four in the initial one to to, to fifteen and point two or something and seeing if it if, if it works in here or oh oh I see in the in the in the antimony. Yeah, yeah. Start yeah. from the beginning. Fif generate a new code. Fifteen and point, point two. What? Just something. Two? Yeah. Yeah. Different. Sure thing. Uh, and then we'll just. Rerun that, and then we'll rerun this. And yeah, so it again, it again gets pretty close in both, except for the one, the first one that had a really high K for some reason. It just it gets it gets a perfect, even better than these two, <laughs> and then it doesn't change it doesn't change K at all. Anybody else? But you see, this is it, right? This this is a good illustration. Even a very simple case. If you start too far away, it doesn't get it. Does anybody else have something they want to show, or that's great? So, we we did something similar. I, I did. We did have the same question though as um, Zach's group, which is what that three versus. I mean, sometimes it's not a three, but like that number off to the side. Uh, I'm not. If anyone has any, if, if it's one, it worked. If it's anything other than one, it failed. Really? Uh, okay. So I, the the documentation says that if it's a one through a four, then it works, okay. and that anything but that is a failure. I was so going to say that's why we were confused. It throws up an explicit error message. You get like the CVODE convergence failure if it if it doesn't run to completion, or if it runs to completion and, and doesn't get there. Right, so, so there are a couple of different things that can happen with an optimizer. One of them is that the optimizer numerically crashes. That, that'll throw an error. The other one is it runs until whatever its criteria for being done are, and it says, I can't do any better, but, but it can still be bad. And so one means that it got something that it thinks is pretty good, and the other ones are, remember, you can have things like local minima, flat surfaces. So the reason that there are all those different op output conditions are because of that. So how does it know, like, how does it, how is it measuring its certainty as far as the success goes? That I don't remember. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my rule was simply to look at if it's not a one, I blew it. Uh, but but that's uh, you 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 should definitely read up on it. I'm not. I, I will be the first person to admit that I do not have a good answer. Anybody else have something they wanted wanted to to show? Maybe. So did did people did people any did people try the code that I gave, or was it, did people try it on their own? I mean the the actual the actual code you needed for the first step here was just this solution equals optimize least squares residual. All you need to do is use the code we already have. Um, and you already answered this. And then the next thing was to try to run it um, to write to run the two over on top of each other and see how they did. And so what I would like people to do if you didn't use my code is to now grab that example one and run it. Uh, just take a minute and do that and make sure that you see this output. And you're welcome to revert back to your code if you like it better, be more relevant. But just make sure that it works. And Porva, even if you're following their coding, it's important that you do that. So I wanted you to, you can share, you can screen share to just show how this works. Okay, for Yeah, sure. Again, I understand that trying to code fast is not easy, but, but at least I want to make sure everybody can run the code we have.
Is there a Zoom glitch in the share? Looks fine to me. Because I have a box floating over my screen share. No, I'm seeing the slide exercise 14.4. Yeah, everything's clear on our end. Yeah. I have one of those Zoom ghost boxes in the middle of my screen. Corva, did that run for you? Yes, it did. You want to just show us quickly what you got? Yeah, sure. Okay. Just a second. Yes. Okay, so when, when you execute it, what happened? Yeah, uh, first when I just, I did this, uh, I just ran your initial code. I got uh, like these Why don't you just, uh, just execute it and let's see what we got. This is... Um, I um. Uh, can you just uh, repeat that? What did you ask me? Just, just run the cell so we can all see the output. Um. This. Um. Okay. This one. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have to correct it. Mm hmm. Um, can uh, can Zach help me with this one? Sure, anybody. Um, yeah, so I think I think with this code you're supposed to uh, for sure. I think it was written in Python two. So um, on line forty five, you need the the parentheses around uh, for the print statement. Um, yeah, I got that. And then also, I think you need, uh, well, it doesn't show up on the screen at least when you're sharing it. Um, but also on 44, you need to have one and one as uh, doubles or so, like, or a floating point. So 1.0 instead of just the integer. Um, yeah. I'm guessing that this is because it's an older version or something like that that was originally written in four where you could use integers. A parentheses. I did add some, I did add the parentheses and. Well, what, what happens when you execute this cell? It throws an error? It's, it's yeah, it's, it's actually throwing an error name. Oh, okay. Okay, but we're, we're not seeing the error. We're just seeing the text. Oh, maybe, oh, shit. I guess my slow. You might be sharing the wrong window, perhaps. Um, I'm I'm sharing Jupiter Tellurium window. Right, but yes. it's not showing you executing this the, the cell. If you hit shift enter, what happens? I would just restart the screen file. share real quick. Okay.
I'm pretty sure everything that Zach said, though, does fix the errors that you get. There it is. Yeah. There we or, go. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess maybe uh, earlier it was not showing anything. Yeah. That looks better. So. Um, so in this case, you probably have to change opt to optimize. Yeah, I did. I think Lindsay means for the for the file below where I think is it's generating the errors. Oh uh, yeah, because because it uh it was important because when I was writing it uh it or when we were writing it we used opt instead of optimize for the yeah. report. Great. Yeah. Okay, so I got it. You got it. Thank you. That's great. Appreciate it. Yeah. I know it takes some work, but that's why it's important to everybody to help each other. No, actually, it was showing earlier also, but I don't know what happened. Okay, so you got it to work. Again, the, the actual call that you need here was pretty simple, right? The, the, it was solution equals optimized least squares, calling residual, we printed solution. And then to display it, we did a plot, and I here I plotted them on top of each other, one with dots and one with lines. So the next thing that I'd like you to do, and maybe we don't need to do this in breakout rooms, is to ask the question in the real world, is, is everybody, does everybody now have the working version of the code, either your own or mine? So the next step is actually really simple which is to say in the real world, experimental data aren't perfect. In the real world, experimental data have noise of various kinds, systematic and otherwise. And so what we are going to do is when we generate our initial target, we are going to add some random noise to that target. And what I'd like you to do is add uh, random noise. In this case, it's, it's proportional noise. Uh, so that when you generate your initial sequence, we're going to go through that data set and we're going to add a small random normal amount. And that normal 0, 0,1 controls the amplitude of the noise. If you made it 0.2, the noise would be bigger. 0.3, the noise would be bigger. So I'd like everybody to add that one line to the target generation and now rerun the simulation and ask how well are you able to calculate the parameters you use to generate your initial your, your, to generate the initial data set. And you can try it for noise of 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And ask the question, how good is your fit? And if you have the code that we have, this is adding what two lines to the code and then running it a few times. Is that is that a clear a clear exercise? Because we've established that if if there's no noise it fits pretty well. But now, if there's noise, we don't know. So I don't think people will get stuck here, but 
this is more or less what I got. I didn't show my results. Do people need more time or is this working? I think the time is more to try. How did it go? If the noise was 0.1, how well were you able to fit? So I went ahead and I pushed it to 0.8 because it looked like 0.1. It's doing pretty good. And even 0.8 was decent. It estimated that the forward rate of A was 0.38 approximately and that the initial condition for A was um, 9.22. So that's still pretty close to our original values. Anybody else? Did anybody get it big enough that it broke? Did it matter what your initial guesses were when you had noise? I was about to say, Connor, because I think it's random. When I put 0.8, mine was terrible. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work as well. I'm surprised. I, I I didn't just run it once. I ran it a few times, but maybe let me try it one more time. I guess this could be the case of like you flip coins and you still manage to get. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Anybody, anybody I, else? What did you get? Zach, what happened? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I mean, I just got basically what you got. Um, well, actually, a little, a little different. Um, but it was, I, I didn't like, I didn't fiddle with it too much. I just kind of ran the the default uh, initial uh, setup that we had. Um, but yeah, it was it was approximately right. If you turn the noise up, so you say random normal zero comma point eight, what happened? Gotta find where that is. <laughs> uh, 0 0.8. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Well, at least it, it initially is terrible. Uh, after like at you know at T1, it's way off, but then it, it gets pretty good pretty quickly. Um, so it yeah, sure. Uh doo -doo -doo. and if yeah. there's somebody who wants to yeah. call one that I haven't, then please please let me know because I'm not trying to I'm trying to go around the room, but I'm so if I, yeah. Good. So, so yes. Yeah, so, so it looks like maybe, maybe that initial point isn't getting. Oh no! But it's being moved to twelve and ten, right? It was originally ten, so it is getting kicked. Oh uh, yeah. So, what was the? What was the? Um, what were the fitting parameters that it came up with? Uh, one point seven eight and eleven point nine. And what was what was it supposed to be? What was the decoder? It was, was supposed to be 10 and 0. 0.4. So, so that's pretty bad. Yeah, especially in K. It seems to consistently do terrible when it comes to K for whatever reason. And why don't you run it a second time and see if it comes up with 1.78 to do exactly the same run? But oh yeah. Clear. There we go. Yeah. So now now it's not now it's not doing now it's not kind of messing up like it did before, but it seems like it just kind of overshoots in one direction and then uh -huh. figures it out. Right. So what were the values that came up with with that one? Uh, 0.35 and 12.2. So okay. better, better in so, the K direction. So so if you show, can you show me your code for a second? Yeah, I mean, I just used the code that right. was in the, that was right. in your right. um, thing. So, so I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm which is move the code for the generator that first um, basically down to where your cursor is there um, into a separate cell. Uh, so this, this part? Keep going down, go down, down, down to where it says plot show through the plot show. Oh, I see. Yeah, grab all, all of, of that. Yeah, and, okay. move, well, and you'll have to go all the way to the top because you'll need the top, okay. And move it, move it into a separate cell. Okay. And the reason I'd suggest doing this is no, now run that cell, run that cell by itself. Okay. 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 And now Oops. run the uh, next. Here we go. Now run the next cell. And now you can run that second cell, just the second, that next cell again. Oh, run it again. Okay. All right. And now you can do the fit. Now, because the way you had it before, when you ran the whole thing, it generated a new target set. 
So you couldn't see what happened to try to if you tried to fit the same thing multiple times. But now you can separate generating the target from, from doing the fit. So you can see, do I get the same result? The answer here is it's deterministic, so you should probably, but let's yeah. see. It keeps getting the same result if I run the second part by okay, itself. So now, so now you could say, well, now in the second one, what if I change the initial guess? Do I get the same result? Uh, the initial guess. That's in that solution is. equals optimized least squares. Ah, I see, right here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. I'll try. So yeah, the the guess is significantly off. Yeah. So now it's making a mess. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you. That was great. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so a lot of times it doesn't matter whether you have everything in one cell or not, but the great big advantage of splitting things up is that you can rerun just pieces of the simulation. And so sometimes it's nice to split things up. Okay. So that's a good one. So now um, if we want to use the global optimizers, then the one thing that we have to do is we have to change our simulation code so that instead of instead of um, returning a vector of errors, it, it does the sum squared. Um, and uh, if we use some of the fancier ones, um, we have to um, we may have to do things like define the range of each parameter that's allowed. Um, and that's done with square brackets, uh, the way it's shown. And so there are a variety of options here that we have to play with. Uh, but the one thing that you're gonna have to do, and maybe since time is limited, I will just ask you to load the code rather than having you write it, uh, would be to update uh, the, the fit so that instead of calculating the, uh, giving you the vector residuals, it does the sum of the square. And I'd also like now to do a slightly more complicated model, which is A goes to B and B goes to nothing. So now we have one, two, three, four parameters. The initial value of A, the initial value of B, K1 and K2. And I think I, in the interest of time, I will ask you to, uh, to just load my code and I'll walk you through it. So pull up example two. And again, you may have to make a few changes because of the, the, the age of these examples. So uh, the things that you've already changed should work. Um, you'll be loading a new, um, a new model, which is the two-step model. And now your residual function, the one thing that's different is instead of returning diff, which is what you did before, you're returning n pi dot sum of diff squared. So you're changing one line in that call. So you could do that by hand too, if you don't want to open the other one. I'll give people a minute to do I think the only edits you need to make are the same exact ones that Zach said last time. Also, if you've already made those edits, instead of copying, just, just replacing everything by example two, you could just add this line return to change the return line instead of saying return diff, return n pi dot sum of diff squared. Um, that's the only change you need there. And then add add the extra uh, line to the uh, to the model. So instead of just a goes to nothing, it would be a goes to b, b goes to nothing. And in this particular case, I've assumed that I know the initial values of A and B. I'm just fitting K1 and K2. 
I talked about you have to choose which parameters you're going to fit. And the more parameters you fit, the harder time your optimizer will have. So, so this particular code that you've got only fits K1 and K2. It assumes you know the values of A0 and B0. If we had a little bit more time, I'd have you play with that and see what the difference is. But let me give you time to get example two to work. Thinking about a biological model, uh, can we not get actually uh, A and B easily because we can count cells? And if we think about concentration, that's harder to quantify in that sense. So assuming that you know the initial case for A and B is not so far off. Well, suppose let's suppose that our example were infection and we were doing an SIR model of infection, which people did a lot of back in 2020. One of the key parameters in the model is how many infected people entered your population at the beginning. Your simulation is incredibly sensitive to that initial number of infected people coming into New York City. Nobody knows what that number is. It was bigger than or equal to one because if it was zero, there would have been no cases. But whether it was one infected person or 10 infected people or 100, we don't know because nobody was checking. So there certainly are times when the initial values of the populations are known, but not always. So this is an example exactly of what I, we were saying. That you have to think about the problem. If you can measure it, then don't fit it. Use the measured value. But sometimes you can't. So you have to decide carefully what you're going to fit. You want to fit as few different things as possible. Yeah, or even if you can measure, right? Sometimes the measurement, you're not sure if the measurement was 100% correct. So testing other possibilities or giving a, no. a band for it, it's better. Well, as you see, you notice that some of those simulate those fits return they return values and the fit even looked good right i mean you drew the line the line looked good but the values were not the ones you used to generate all right everybody got this working does anybody need more time on this all right. okay so now uh in this example, uh, you've got some options. There's a place where it says, uh, there, there are three lines that say solution, optimize, and then one of them, two of them are commented out, and one is turned on. Does everybody have that? If it, if it runs, what does it do? I have something like this. Is that does that is this, is does it run that way? Yeah, it does. Okay. If you try a different initial guess, what happens? Somebody, does it work? How? By the way, how long did it take to give you a result? Was it instant or did it take time? It took time, a little bit. Um. Why don't you try, somebody try, again, I, I, I want to get a little bit further I, and I don't want to run out of time, which is why I'm pushing a little bit because there are a couple of rather important points I want to make. I would love to spend more time. Can somebody just sort of rat people randomly try one of the other optimizers? There are three, turn, there are three options. Just take one of them and ask the question, does it work? I tried the buzzing hopping, it's working. Okay, does it give the same result as the other one? Yeah, same result. Anybody it took else? longer time though. A simulated annealing has a tendency to get lost. It would take really a long time to run. Okay. Everybody got it working? Yeah, differential evolution also works. Um, that one took way longer for me than minimized did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's for me. Great. It takes Thanks. longer time than the other two. 
But the fact that you're saying that less than two minutes after I asked the question already means it's running pretty fast. Uh, if you had seven or eight parameters, it might take two hours or three hours to come back. So again, some of these choices that I've made in the exercises are based on the fact that I want to be able to do it in, in, a, in a three hours. Okay, now why don't you turn the noise on? So put your noise back into your simulation. And again, if you want to, to do that, um, uh, I wouldn't, don't, don't jump to the example two because then you have to fix those things. Just add those, if you want, you could open example two and grab those lines, just add the noise and try that out or just add the noise by hand the way we did before and ask the question, what happens? Does it make a difference or not? And does the difference depend on which optimizer you use? I wish I had three or four lectures to do this because there's so much to do. But at least you'll have seen a little bit of it. I, I, how many people have covered these issues in other classes? You're Zach, so you're familiar with Pete Eden. So for you, this is a review. So you can you can help help everybody, Lindsay, everybody. All right. So so maybe I'm maybe I'm preaching to the converted. Certainly, if you've done neural networks, you've you've, you've done a lot of optimization. I will say that I I don't know in the, in the context that I have learned some of these things before. It's been more about optimizing according to an abstract fitness function than it is to a um, actual experimental data set. So I will say some of the nuances are different from how I've encountered it in the past. I mean, for me, uh, it is a little different as well in that I've always been meaning to learn scipy.optimize um, and never have. I've always just used code that like, you know, does optimization manually. Um, and this is a lot, you know, this, this is useful to actually be able to know how to do that. Again, there, there are so many op, op, options in LMFIT or SciPy. Uh, we can't begin to explore all the possibilities. But, but one of the reasons, again, one of the reasons that there's so many options is because there are no perfect optimizers. Optimization really is an art. And so at some level, we're, we, we have to accept, uh, accept that. And to some extent, you, you try them and see what works. Sometimes nothing works. Does, does, did, did people have any experience when you, when you added noise? Did it make a difference? Did it fit or not fit when you had noise? I got lucky. I, even with uh, 0 0.8, I got a good fit, but only once. <laughs> so sometimes you ran it and it worked and sometimes it didn't. That happens too. Anybody else? Peter? My friend, 0.1 or 0 0.01, I should say, at my sigma. But yeah. even with modifying both A and B at the same time, there's no fitting. It's a bit off. Uh, meanwhile, if I only modify A, then it will fit. So that, that can happen because we're, we have to combine the error signal from A and B. And if we balance them, that, that may not, that may overemphasize one. In neural networks, when you calculate loss functions, you get this a lot. The choice of loss function is super important when you're training a neural network because you, know, you may have, especially for things like images, uh, if you want to just match the face, then it's the high pixel values, it's easy. But if you want to match the face in the background and the pixel values are very different in the face in the background, coming up with a loss function that works for both is really hard. Because the, the best loss function will depend on the data structure that you have. Okay, so the next step was, and this one I, I'm torn, and I'll let you 
tell me what you would like to do. This is the only one that I do not have uh, I, I, an example built for you. And on the one hand, I'd love to have you do one on your own. On the other hand, we only have half an hour left. And I did want to come to, to uh, some pathology. So, so my tendency would be to skip this exercise and leave it to you as something to try on your own. Uh, the, 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 this, this model actually is built into the last exercise. Uh, but uh, if people, if people, um, it, this one, is, it's pretty interesting. You, you've had a couple of weeks where you played with these feed forward networks and how they behave. Uh, and uh, in this case, you have quite a few parameters, really quite a few. You have the, K, the capital Ks, the lowercase Ks, the initial values, the weights. Um, and so uh, to try to actually uh, match things here, if you, put, if you let everything vary, is, is actually pretty challenging. Um, and so I, I would just say, uh, and, and I apologize for skipping this, but I think there's, there's another thing. If we have time in a few minutes, we can come back to this, but let's put this one aside for the moment, because I do want to come to something that's actually pretty important that, that I think is, is missed a lot of time. Um, so this was the, just my example of fitting the feed flow. So I want to come to the idea of prediction. So we've done we've done some fits, and we've seen well if our initial guesses are really bad, we our fit doesn't converge. Um, if we have a lot of noise, sometimes it converges and sometimes not. Sometimes it'll do a fit and it'll seem to draw lines through the data, but the values of the parameters are different from the ones we use to generate the data. So what that's telling us is that just because the line goes through the, the experimental data points doesn't mean the model is right. And uh, one of the ways that we really would like to be able to use models is to extrapolate. What happens if we change what happens if we just fit K1 and K2, and now we give it a different A0? Should do the same thing that we predicted, that it should work. The model should work outside of its training range. Um, and in this case, we have to do cross-validation. We have to do what we do in, in machine learning, which is have a training set and a test set. And that if the model works for the training set and doesn't work for the test set, we have what's called a misfit. We have a model that happens to work with the things we trained it on, but doesn't work outside of the trainings. And there are a number of things that can happen. Um, some of which are, none of which are good, but some of which are good, but manageable, and some of which are serious. So one thing that one kind of misfit would be that our model never converges, that it never gives us a result, or gives a result that obviously doesn't fit the training data. And that's not a problem. It's annoying because we don't get our parameter values, but we at least know something is wrong. On the other hand, we could have a model where our, our fit works. But when we try to apply that model outside of the training data, it fails. And that's dangerous because we have no way of knowing that that's going to happen. We're happily going to say we have a model that works, but it gives us the wrong prediction. And that's pretty serious. And now there's something that tends to be talked about a little bit less in the neuroscience context, which is that the source of the misfit could be multiple things. What if the structure of my model were correct? A goes to B, B goes to nothing. But the rate laws, the, the structural functional form of the rate laws was wrong. That would be one kind of misfit. Another one could be that the model structure was wrong. I wrote A goes to B, B goes to nothing. But in fact, it was a feed forward network 
with A goes to B goes to C and A goes to C direct. That's how the model structure was wrong. In one case, the problem is that I guessed the dynamics, the interactions wrong. The model structure was, fit, was wrong. The other case was that the dynamics that I imposed on that model structure were wrong. In both cases, we will find that our, our optimizer will happily fit the wrong model to our experimental data. That wrong data will in fact match pretty well, at least sometimes. But then if we try to generalize, we get garbage. And that's the thing that I wanted to leave you with is the lesson for today. And that's why I wanted to jump ahead because I don't think that that's always taught. Now, maybe I hope for the optimization that you guys have done, who've done it already, that this was a point that was made loudly. That just because you get a really good fit doesn't mean that you've got the right predictable capability. And of course, if you're doing neural networks and the fits are very complicated, maybe that doesn't surprise you. If you're fitting two curves like the ones we're doing, the fact that you can still get a misfit is, is a little bit more surprising. So what I'd like people to do is uh, to generate your data uh, using A goes to B, B goes to nothing with the linear rates that we had. And then we're going to fit where the first one is replaced with Michaelis. And the first question is, do you get anything out of it? The second one is how good is the fit? And the third one is if I change, we're only fitting K1 and K2, we're not going to fit uh, initial values of A and B. Now we change initial values of A and B with the fitted Ks. Does it work or not? And here I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. It's called misfit one, if you want to load. You can try this on your own or you can try misfit one. And we have two, two exercises to get through here. And so would people like to do this on their own or would you like to do this in breakout rooms? What would be, what would be most effective? And you can jump ahead and use misfit one if you want, uh, or you can try doing it. It only is a couple of lines to. You're now going to have to have two, you're going to have to take your model string and have two different model strings because the one you use to generate your training data is not going to be the model string you use for, for the inside the optimums. I'm a little embarrassed about the, 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 the not catching the, the Python 2, Python 3 chain. It just shows that I didn't, I didn't try uploading it to NanoHub. I ran it desktop. And I must have a really old edition of Spider on my desktop machine. <laughs> or maybe it recognized that it was Python 2 and Switch. I don't know. But, it, but all of the code ran as it was. I checked. Yeah, I mean, you have a, uh, at the top of the, all the code, you have the user slash bin slash environment, uh, Python 2. So um, it should, I mean, assuming that it's named Python 2 in your environment, um, then yeah, it'll just automatically do that. Um, but I think for most people, they either just don't have Python 2 installed because it's finally, finally dying. Uh, or or they have it named as regular Python, which is the default for at least for Mac OS. I know. Which one reason to switch is that Python is becoming a fair bit faster um, in recent updates, even in its base. So still slow compared to most things, but it's faster 
the, the relative is what matters. <laughs> Well, I, I sure wish that Python or one of the compiled Pythons had taken off. Uh, I mean, there is the built-in one. Uh, I forget what it's called. Is it Python C or Pi C? Whatever it's, yeah. I don't know Python. what it's called, but when I mean, you can, um, I, mean, I don't think it's, is it Cython? Yeah. I know there's C Python and there's Cython and it's confusing, but, but one of them is like built in now. So when you run it, it'll automatically uh, create uh, .pyc files. Um, okay, I didn't know that 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 that. I know. I yeah. mean, there's a problem that dynamic typing and things don't work in a compiled language, and so some of the some Python things don't work. Must, they must break. Well, you can still do it, and then it just interprets those lines. It doesn't compile them. Or yeah. Well, so you can have it dynamic, and then it will it will compile them into its best guess of what, like what, what type it should use. Um, and so then, so then it'll, it'll, it'll save it however it needs to, but you can still type dynamically. Um, so. But then, but that means the execution of the compiled code and the, and the interpreted code could be different. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know how they do all that. Um, Cause I know there's also issues with like, with threading specifically, because Python has such a weird way of doing multi-threading. Uh -huh. um, it's kind of a hacky way. So I know that some compilers just completely break that and some find a way around it. Okay. I, I, I'm fascinated by this, but I probably should get us back to our problem because I want to make sure <laughs> we get through our last couple of exercises. We could talk more about this. You could teach me more later. <laughs> okay. did, did people get this to work? Did the people get misfit to work? What happened? Was it, it failed. Bad, was it a bad? So that's a good result. Failure is a good result here. This is what I got. So the good news is that if it if it fails, it means we know it didn't work. So to be that's a success. Uh, did it work? Did did it converge for anybody? I got failure for the first two functions, and then the last one, the uh, uh, optimized differential evolution one, was the only one that worked for me. Okay. Do you want to show us what you got? And see, I'm surprised that yours gave a result because it's been since the start of <laughs> this thing that I'm running buzzing hopping and nothing happened. I just see a black screen. Did she lose her? Lindsay, are you there? Did you lose your internet? E yes, I did lose my internet, but it, it might be back now. Is we can see it, up? yeah. Yep, okay. Got you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this one is uh, the second one, which just comes up with an error. Um, and then if I switch to the first one, I also get an error. But for me, the third one worked eventually. And when it did it, did it produce a line that agreed with the, the, the target or did it just produce junk? It produced, it produced junk. what you got on yours. Yeah. So that's all right, too. I mean, if, if inspection tells you that the fit's no good, you're still okay, even if it converged. So that one, I would say, is a safe one. My worry was when you said that 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 in fact it had it had actually it had actually given a good fit. No, no, no. I just it just converged. <laughs> okay, Joel, comment. My buzzing hop came back, and it fits very well. I mean, the 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 variables are all wrong, but the plot looks very good. Nice. That's true. That's true. Yeah, do you want to see? Yes, please. Oh, there we go. This is the result from the buzzing hop. I also had the same problem with the other one, wrote a, a mistake on the 
minimize, but buzzing hop mm -hmm. gave a very nice, I mean, giving what it is, and this is the first one, oh, or the last one in the case. Oh, so okay, so it is, so it is dangerous. It is. So I was overly, I was overly optimistic. If you, if you give the, if you give your optimizer enough time, it will and, screw you. Up. Yeah, yeah, enough okay. power. Okay, great. Well, that was uh, that was. Uh, so I, I, I wasn't patient enough in, in 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 seeing whether I could mess things up. That was great. Thank you. All right. So now, let's try uh, a hill function instead of the Michaelis function in uh, in that uh, target. So just replace K1A over uh, K plus A with K1A cubed over K cubed plus A cubed. And try again. So you just have to change one line, which is the second, the second model. Yeah, I think you also call it V and K1, and but they are, have the same value, so they're supposed to be the same feature. I got a fit that was a little bit better than the last one. Still not great, but it's closer. Yeah, this is my misfit two example, but you people shouldn't shouldn't need to go there. Yeah, so so in my experience, this one fits pretty well. You get this little bit of overshooting here. Um, you do you see my cursor when I screen share? Okay, so so this this overshoot here on the blue and the undershoot a little bit on the red, but it looks pretty good. So now the next thing to do is to change the initial values of a and b and here what i want you to don't 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 refit keep the parameter values that you had and now just change a and b a naught and b naught and see what happens because you were fitting only for your case so now the question is what happens when you change just A naught and B naught? And if you, again, we'll jump ahead a little bit. This is called misfit prediction, if you want. But they get people can do it by hand. And here you should find that it makes a mess. The, 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 the fitted parameter values work for that specific case, but the k's are not right when you go to different initial a's and b's. And so this is the problem that you face all the time, which is that you can have something that works over your training set, but when you try to extrapolate rather than interpolate, your model fails. And that's very dangerous because in biology, typically we're dealing with extrapolation. Sometimes we're lucky and we're only doing interpolation and then our, our fits, we have a little bit more confidence in our fits. But, but in the real world, if you're dealing with 
for example, medical treatment, you're trying to design a medical treatment for a patient, that patient has never had that treatment before. So by definition, you're extrapolating. There was an advertisement that there used to be in Scientific American. I don't remember which pharma company, but it was a very powerful one. It says, the pill you take was never tested. That reminds me of a joke on my first semester of stats in university. Terrible professor, but this joke was nice. We usually make fun of the Portuguese. We call them dumb. And he was saying that the this Portuguese guy went to Brazil and he found matches and he was marveled by matches. And he took the matches back to Portugal, gave them them around, and his friends are like, Well, but they don't work. And they're like, How come they don't work? I've tested them all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's the same, the same philosophy. Um, uh, but a lot of things have to be done on trust. And so, so, so confidence is, 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 is a tricky thing to assess. And so this, this little exercise is trying to give you some skepticism about ability to predict. Did people get that to run? Was that running for people? And I do appreciate your patience with me in pushing a little bit fast through this, but there's, there's one final exercise I want to do as an illustration of the problems that we face. Okay. So this was the one that I alluded to at the beginning, which is, we now have our feed, our A goes to B, B goes to nothing. And we're going to try to model it with our incoherent feed forward network. And I'm not going to ask you to try to do this by hand. I'm going to ask people to, to actually uh, pull uh, the example misfit three. And see what see what that does. Right, because the previous ones, what we did, we had the correct, in the previous ones, we had the correct model structure, but the wrong rate equations. In this case, I, we have the wrong model structure. What happened? I don't know. It's still running. Still I running. chose buzzing wrapping. It's extremely slow. Yeah, so I'll say that's what I chose too. And um, I'm four minutes and 30 seconds. And yeah, it's still running. 
Uh, mine did run, but it's not showing the same result. So I was, uh, I tried the different one, but mm -hmm. it's still running. Well, you I mean it doesn't show the same result as what I have on the screen? No, the it's it's just showing the dots, not anything else. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Okay. So the last one, the last one is this. And this one again, this one, um, I don't remember. Let me see. Do I have this? Yes, I do. Okay. Do I have this fit for? In the download, let me check. Yes, I do. So the last one now is a little bit different. And this is the last one I want to do. So, so we showed that if we tried to fit the feed forward network to our target, it didn't work. So again, that's safe. Well, it may be safe because as, as Lindsay found was able to show, if you were patient with the one that I thought was safe, it wasn't because the optimizer found a way of making it apparently work. So in this case, I want to try a slightly different one, which is we have A goes to B and B goes to nothing. That, that's something that is reasonable. And now I want to fit it to a model that is pretty close which is A goes to C, C goes to B, and B goes to nothing. That is that there's an intermediate species between A and B that we don't know about. And that happens pretty commonly in, in, in signaling networks, I'll tell you. Um, it's pretty often that we don't, there are intermediate states that we don't know about. And so uh, we might expect in this case, actually to be able to fit very well, because suppose K1 were infinitely fast. So A turns into C immediately. Then if K3 were K1 and K2 were K2, we should get exactly what we had before. So we actually would expect that it was possible for these two models to give the same result. Now, whether our fitting algorithm will come up with that solution is another question. In this case, it won't, again, as it happens, but you can see that. Now, you actually, if you look at the solutions up above the fit is perfect line, you'll notice that one is seven, 10 to the minus one, so 0.7. The third one is 0.4. And the middle one is 1,500. So it's basically making K3 so big that it doesn't do anything. So it's basically jumping over, which is what I talked about. So actually, it's making a biologically meaningful approximation. But why don't people try that and see what they get? So in this case, in this case, the, the, the fit actually seems to make sense. You can make a biological argument for that fit. And then the last question was going to be, does it generalize? And you'd hope that if the if leaving out C made, didn't really make a difference, then it should generalize. But will it or won't it? All right. And if it will or won't, when and why? And this, this is what I'd like to leave you with. I want people to keep, I'll talk a little bit, but I want people to keep playing with it. This is what I want to leave people with because when we see pathway diagrams, and this whole class has really been about pathway diagrams, uh, we, we tend to take those as if they were facts. But in fact, every molecule in a cell interacts with every molecule in the cell. Some of them interact strongly, some interact less strongly. But what we identify as pathways are what we think 
are the stronger interaction. But we're always leaving out the weak ones when we do that. And there are a lot more weak ones than there are strong ones. So that's already something. Secondly, we know that there are, in fact, things that we don't know. There could be strong pathways that we don't have identified. There could be intermediate chemical states that we haven't identified. And so when we draw these pathways, uh, we can't assume that the biological reality that's abstracted by that pathway is what's there. And here we've got about the simplest possible case. There's one element in the middle of the pathway that we've, we've overlooked. And we want to ask the question, does that change our ability to predict what happens or not? So I'll give people a minute. Were people able to get this one to run? Let's see, Misfit 4. Gabriel, did it work for you? Sorry, my uh, the previous Misfit actually just finished running for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, which, I'm running this one now. Which optimizer were you using? I was using the uh, the basin hopping. It takes so, a while. Yeah, yeah, I was in the same boat as Gabe. After 10 minutes of running, I finally got my very bad result from the, the three basin hopping. <laughs> yeah, so so since I'm running basin hopping again, I'll let you know like tomorrow how this next <laughs> misfit goes. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody get this one to work? This one actually converges usually pretty fast because, because it does get a good fit. Yeah, if your guesses are reasonable to start with. I got it, but um, the initial values is very weird, very small or very big actually. For some, it's big. For others, they're small. Sorry. Okay. Anybody else? I want to give people, like, Joel tends to talk a lot, so I want to give somebody else a chance to weigh in on this. Who, who hasn't said anything? Danusha. What did you get? I still did not get a result for the previous one itself. That one is still running, so I'm not able to run the next one yet. Anybody else? So the last, the last question was generalization. We fit the values of K1, K2, and K3. And now we ask, how well does it generalize? And the answer is, of course, that uh, at least one species, which is C, is present in the, the second model, the wrong model, but wasn't present at all in the first model. And so if we introduce C, it's going to immediately make a mess because there's no way A goes to B, goes to nothing, can know about species C. So if we start with a non-zero amount of C, we get, and keep our parameter values the same, we get total mess. And so that, that's the last thing in our last four minutes. I'd ask you if you have time, try misfit for predictions. And I'm not going to, since we have the since we have the problem set already for the noise, and you've got your projects too, I'm not going to have the opportunity to give you a homework problem on that. Uh, but I would encourage you to play with that misfit for example on your own a bit, and explore what you can learn about what is how you can have confidence or not in your ability to generalize. In this case, the fit is so good that you would have no reason to say, expect that there was anything wrong. If I look at that top figure, my blue line and my red line go through my target points exactly. There's no error. And yet, if I now change my initial conditions, I get something that doesn't work. That's a very frightening result. And so 
I think if nothing else, I'd like to leave you today with a healthy skepticism for the generalizability of models. Does that mean they're always wrong? No. Does it mean that you should give up on modeling? No. But does it mean that ultimately when you have a prediction, you have to go back to experiment to validate it? That a prediction of a model is always a suggestion? Then yes. And I, I, there may be a simpler example where you can show that. But for me, I thought about this a lot over the years. And to me, this is about the simplest example I can come up with that shows that problem. If people have other suggestions, I'd be delighted to incorporate that in a class another year. So that's what I wanted to leave people with. It was this, uh, this rather disturbing result to me. Now, one other thing that we didn't talk about was this idea of, of identifiability parameters. So we haven't looked at the goodness of fit. Uh, when you run these simulations, you can use that error function that you generated to say, how good is the fit? If that error is small, if it's good. If the error is big, if it's bad. You run the simulate, you run your, for different initial conditions, you run your optimizer a thousand times. And now you say, I'm going to take all of the parameter sets that were within 1% of the best result. And I'll display those as a cloud of points. If you're lucky, those points are all near each other in the hyperspace of the parameters. In that case, you know your parameter values pretty well. If you're unlucky, those parameter sets are all over the place and there is no identification of parameters at all. That can happen, but usually it only happens for one or two parameters. A third thing you'll get is that you'll see a line of parameters, all of which are about the same. And what that's telling you is that you can trade off. There was some hidden trade off where the parameters were not independent of each other. And in that case, the dynamical systems approach a parameter of a variable reduction and de-dimensionalization helps you. And that's not something we had a chance to talk about in this class. But Herbert does have some code that allows you to explore those things. And I'm afraid in those cases, things are even slower because you have to not only run the simulation to convergence, but you have to do it many, many, many times uh, to be able to see what happens. Um, but it is something else to think about. And it's something uh, that's a little bit separate from this issue of uh, model structure identifiability. Well, there's a reason people don't like doing model structure identifiability, which is that there, you can't continuously tra transform one model structure into another. And optimizers typically depend on being able to do continuous hopping. In your, in your parameter space, you move your parameter values are small distances. Uh, you can't do that with model structures. And so uh, we don't really have good algorithms. There are, there are methods out there to try to do it. Uh, but in general, uh, trying to iterate over different possible model structures is very hard and optimized. So that's something uh, that you'll you run into. It's an inter it's a topic of current research. It's not it's it's definitely not a solved problem. All right. Are there any final questions for today or comments uh, before we meet next week to go over projects? I have, I have something. Um, a, a bunch of us were, were talking a little bit and we just feel maybe that a homework assignment might be a little bit too much for this week, considering we have to meet with two other groups and are finishing up our projects and preparing for presentations next week. Um, okay. And the homework assignment was not short <laughs> upon first glance. Um, so I don't know how you feel about that. That's but I don't fine. Think don't, just, okay. We'll dump the homework assignment. Um, but I, I, I don't have a problem with you not doing the homework assignment on stochasticity. Um, somebody asked for it. So uh, uh, 
I, 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 I generate, but uh, I agree with you that it's the end of the semester. People are busy uh, and I don't want to, and you're under enough stress. So, so no worries, don't do the homework assignment. Concentrate on the project. This, this Thanks. semester, this semester, um, there's always a bit of a tension between lectures in class exercises and projects. And this semester, I've covered a little bit less material in lecture, and we spent a little bit more time on the projects. And the result of that was that that particular stochasticity work got put later in the semester. And so that homework assignment actually was revised, but that homework assignment got delayed. But, but I think you're right. Uh, it is too much. Um, so if people are interested in the problem, you do have it. You can always go back to it, but don't don't worry about it. Just don't 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 worry. About it. And and I appreciate you being being willing to bring that up. Uh, it, it's it's easy you know, when when there's a push, which is it's easy for me to write an assignment. Uh, but I don't know how many wa how much water is coming down the pipe unless you answer me about it. And so I'm I'm very happy that you brought. It. Anything else that you want to they want to cover? No. Okay. Well then, uh, the only other thing that the only other thing that um, the only other thing that uh, uh, if people need last minute advice, I can try to give that. Uh, probably not next two days for a variety of reasons, but maybe over the weekend I can help out with it. Um, but uh, I appreciate everybody being patient. I appreciate people's experimenting with the breakout rooms and things like that. Um, I hadn't tried this kind of grouping of people for. Uh, before, and I know it sometimes works better than others. Um, so your patience. And I did in the, in the in the course evaluation material, I did add some extra questions specifically on those kind of issues. So I, I, I would appreciate your feedback on what worked and what didn't. Um, I realize that doesn't help you this semester. But I do take those things very seriously, and I try to change things semester to semester. And sometimes a little bit like the optimizer, somebody a semester will strongly say, "Please change this," so I'll overshoot in the other direction uh, because it's a high dimensional space. But uh, for that I, I really did want to at least do some optimization before the end of the semester. So I'm glad we got to do this. And you got a little bit of stochasticity. The one thing we didn't get was the dynamical systems analysis, but many of you know that from other classes. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, you uh, being available. And I will see you next week uh, for final projects. And if anything comes up, email me and I'll be happy to talk to you. Good night. <laughs>